Welcome to our health and science focus. I'm Yuveka Rangopal. Liposuction, facelifts, boob jobs, Botox, fillers, chemical peels, skin lightening, drips, and the list goes on. Wherever we look, we're bombarded with suggestions of how we can be better versions of ourselves with just a nip, a tuck, or the prick of a needle. And when we're faced daily with images of idealized beauty and perfection, who can blame us for wanting to fix what we see as our very own imperfections? Well, demand for aesthetic procedures and cosmetic surgery have undoubtedly grown in recent years and what was once considered a luxury for the likes of the rich and famous has now become so easily available and some of it even affordable for us ordinary folk many of us have dabbled with the idea of trying just a little Botox or filler or making parts of us seem just that little perkier but do we understand what we're doing to our faces and bodies is it something we really need and if we go down that road when do we stop can we stop? Well, today in our health and science focus, we go further than just a skin deep and we'll ask the experts to help us understand the world of aesthetics and cosmetic surgery and to weigh up the pros and cons, the do's and don'ts. We also talk to a woman who has had surgery. We find out why she did it and what her experience was. And we chat to a psychologist about what could be obsessive behavior when it comes to cosmetic procedures. Now, surgery is not all about enhancing oneself to be aesthetically beautiful. It may be recommended for various reasons, including our health. Whether elective or emergency, they are not without risk. If not performed correctly, it can lead to permanent deformities. To discuss this now, we're joined by four guests this morning. We'll talk to them each separately. Dr. Ridwan Mia, a plastic surgeon. You may remember him as the person who performed that miracle skin graft on Pippi Kruger that saved her life after she was badly burnt in 2011. Doc, a very good morning, and thanks so much for your time this morning. I know that you're very busy, so thanks for making the time. I'm very nervous standing here because I feel like you're looking at me going hmm I can fix that and I can change that and this is what is wrong so let's not go there not today okay we're not doing that today all right so <laughs> let's first talk about the distinction between what is plastic and what is cosmetic surgery and what is invasive and non-invasive if you can clear up for so us. Um, I think in the plastic surgery realm we, we, we tend to uh, classify things as either aesthetic or reconstructive so reconstructive obviously meaning after cancer cancer removal after injuries trauma and birth deformities uh, and usually then aesthetic would be all the cosmetic procedures as you mentioned the nose jobs the tummies the breasts all that sort of thing facelifts etc uh, and then invasive and non-invasive can refer to both. So it's treatments we would do to achieve a result uh, where we would operate, that would be invasive, and where we wouldn't be operating, where things we could do in the rooms where we wouldn't have to cut into the skin, where we would, it would just be things like injectables or, uh, you know, uh, placing skin... Uh, samples on the skin or using certain cosme cosmetic, uh, cosmetic products, that would be non-invasive. So when do you decide then if somebody comes to you and says, this is what I want to do and I'm unhappy with this, uh, when do you decide whether this is going to need a cut or whether this is going to need something like laser? So uh, a good clinical analysis, uh, you know, lots of measurements, uh, photographs. We have a look at how much it means to the patient. And we, we look at various clinical as well as the patient factors. So it must blend with their lifestyle. They must be able to undergo surgery if it's something that requires surgery. If it's not, we offer them the non-invasive uh, you know, uh, techniques that could help them. So it just depends on whether the patient will tolerate surgery, how well they would do with surgery, uh, and whether they actually need surgery or not, and whether there are alternative available techniques. Okay, I'd like to know more about the process before you actually decide what you're going to do for a patient. I mean, somebody could come in with something completely ridiculous or do they come in with very high expectations going, I want to look like Jennifer Aniston or I want to look like Angelina Jolie or Kim Kardashian or Kanye Mba or whatever the story is. How do you decide whether this is right for that patient, whether this will actually work? What's the conversation and the process you involve them in? So uh, every surgeon spends a long time doing psychology, uh, you know, beforehand uh, for that particular reason. Um, the idea is to, uh, you know, have the emphasis on safety first. Uh, surgery is a big deal. Uh, you know, you're, you're violating the skin's integrity to be able to carry out the procedure and make the changes that the person wants. But it's important to assess where the motivation is coming from. Firstly, we want to know that the patient is actually wanting to have uh, whatever surgery done for themselves. It's not an external locus of motivation, so it's not a, a family member who's pressuring them or a boss at work 
or, or peer pressure from friends or other family. Uh, so we have to be sure that their motivation is right. Secondly, it must be appropriate to them. So we have to make sure that a 16-year-old, for example, is not coming to have a nose job, you know, before the nose is completed growing, and that the person is mature enough by themselves, psychologically speaking, to... Um, to, to accept the surgery, uh, to deal with the consequences thereof, and of course, uh, you know, we're not, we're not machines, we're not cars, uh, we can suffer complications, and not everybody heals the same way. So clinically, we have to assure that the patient is able to tolerate the surgery and will heal well, and we have to advise the patient and counsel the patient that, you know, the results may not be Jennifer Aniston or someone else. And, um, it's usually a red flag for many of us practitioners when a patient comes in saying, I want to look like this celebrity or the other because, you know, we're not all gifted uh, to look a certain way. We, 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 we have other attributes and uh, we have to emphasize the good points about us. So I'm going to be naughty. Who, who's the person they want to look like most these days? What are the most requests? <laughs> uh, believe it or not, we still have lots of Jennifer Aniston. Really? We have lots of Angelina Jolie. Really? Um, wow. Absolutely. And though at the moment, the trend is very much Nicki Minaj, uh, very much... Face uh, or other parts? Uh, other parts. Okay. Uh, Beyonce. Uh, you know, we, we have lots of people who want to look like Kim Kardashian. They want her hips. They want her nose. They want her that breasts. That take a lot of surgery, right? Absolutely. Surgery absolutely. on surgery. <laughs> <laughs> Without a doubt. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, very quickly, you, you spoke about age there, and I just want to know uh, what is the, the sort of legal limit when someone can come? What is the, the sort of the age you would start, uh, and, and, and what age would you refuse somebody? Unless, of course, it's life-saving. And, and what else are the other considerations in terms of, of, of health? I mean, how young and how old do mm -hmm. you have to be? What's the cutoff? So there isn't technically an actual cutoff, although we have to apply general guidelines. So someone who's not able to give consent for themselves, they would have to be over. 18 years old, uh, otherwise they would need a parent or guardian, and usually that's a red flag. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't be doing a procedure on someone who's 15, for example, who wants a, a breast augmentation for their birthday. Um, you know, that would, be, that would be taboo, and that would be something we wouldn't do. And somebody very old, the only uh, precondition is that their health would allow them to undergo surgery or to accept the procedure and not have complications. So that's something we would have to extensively counsel them, counsel them about. You get healthy, young-looking, 18 year olds and then you get 50 year olds who just you know their health is in such a bad state for example a, a smoker who's uh, perhaps diabetic or has other illnesses won't tolerate their surgery the way someone who's so young you and go through a whole range of tests would you require them especially at that age to go through certain physical uh, absolutely we, we liaise lots with physicians uh, other surgeons uh, and indeed psychologists as well to make sure that a person is mentally and physically well enough to have surgery Doc, what are the cautions? If somebody's sitting at home this morning, you know, wanting to sort of do something for their summer body or their summer face, what are the cautions, what are the pros and cons that you would advise them about at this stage? So, firstly, I would say research your procedure, the potential procedure you want to have, or and the alternatives. As you said, non-invasive versus invasive, uh, and make sure you see a practitioner who is well experienced, uh, perhaps go on to, if it's going to be a plastic surgeon, perhaps go on to the Association of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgeons of South Africa's website and have a look and see that the surgeon is actually uh, certified. Uh, make sure they have the right qualifications. Please don't go to somebody who's underqualified. We have lots of so-called botched surgeries, uh, people who have gone to perhaps GPs and had um, crazy surgeries done, and many of us have to uh, fix those or try to fix those. So please do that beforehand. And then spend time with your practitioner and write down questions you may have even before and after, and, and try to have more than one consultation before you uh, make the commitment to undergoing the knife uh, or even a non-invasive procedure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, your doctor will rather spend more time with you talking about a procedure than actually doing it. So spend more time doing that. And, and, and certainly, um, you know, the days of telling people not to go online and don't worry about Dr. Google and all that sort of thing, those are gone. Uh, so, you know, if you're going to go online and do your research, make sure you correlate it with what your practitioner tells you. So let's talk affordability very quickly. We, we know generally that it, it, uh, historically it's been very, very expensive to, to go through uh, these procedures. Mm -hmm. and, and I think a lot of people are confused. Will my medical aid cover this? Will it not cover this as well? So mm -hmm. just a quick caution. And also about in that... Uh, in that thought, just about recovery and the pain involved in all of this. I mean, they say there's no beauty without pain, right? But mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a fair amount of, fair amount of pain that, that we should prepare ourselves for. Yeah. Um, you know, 
with, with affordability, I think people, uh, the medical aids will cover certain procedures uh, if there is a medical uh, benefit from it. For example, if you're fi fixing the septum of your nose, your medical aid will pay for that. Of course, they're not going to pay for the cosmetic, uh, what we call the outer or a rhinoplasty side of it, so they're not going to pay for the shape of your nose to change or for you to have a nicer looking nose, but they will pay for your septum, for example, to be fixed so you can breathe more easily. Um, you know, same with breasts, for example, they would pay for reconstructive surgery after cancer but they wouldn't pay for a breast augmentation or a lift. Um, you know, doctors are fighting with medical aids to pay for breast reductions because we, we don't find them to be cosmetic entirely. There's lots of medical benefit in that. Um, and, and I think patients need to worry about their, their own safety profile uh, from that point of view. It, it's difficult for us to convince them, uh, and, and lots of the counseling will happen before the surgery actually happens. So what's the most popular type of surgery that, that we're seeing here in South Africa? What, what are South Africans wanting most done to them? We see lots of breasts. Uh, breast surgery, uh, li breast lifts, breast uh, augmentations, and uh, the so-called mummy makeovers, where women want to have uh, their surgery done after, you know, after all the kids, and they want to get back to their their old bodies beforehand. And affordability is much better these days. Uh, you'll find things are not as expensive as they used to be, and uh, many of your practitioners will modify price for you uh, according to your budget. So it's not as out of reach as people think, and and pain as well. It, it's usually not as painful as people realize, and and we. We have good drugs out there that are safe for administering. So, you know, don't forget your plastic surgeon is still a doctor at the end of the day. So he can look after you. And I think just a, just a caution then is that this is not the magic answer. This is not like once you have your liposuction or once you have that, uh, the, 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 the procedure done that you can stop taking care and you can eat whatever you want and you can do whatever <laughs> you want with your face. It's ongoing, am I right? Absolutely, it's yeah. ongoing. Uh, you have to worry about your diet. You have to worry about your exercise and uh, even the clothes you wear. You know, you have to be very careful. And, and, and we, we take pains to emphasize that to patients and often won't do surgery if we know that a patient is not going to look after themselves. It's usually worse if you gain weight after a procedure where you've had liposuction or a tummy tuck or even change to your breast or face uh, because of weight issues and then go back and, and binge the way you used to. So uh, sometimes we won't even do the surgery if we're not convinced that the patient will behave themselves afterwards because the results can be worse and we do see them. Patients come back years later how wanting you know to redo. How would, how, how would you gauge that? Uh, you try to gauge their lifestyles. Uh, lots of questions about their, their lifestyles, their diets and often Often patients would have their surgery delayed by many months, uh, occasionally years, uh, so that they can go and change their diets, change their exercise routines, and, uh, and even we liaise with gym trainers and physiotherapists and biokineticists to help our patients along, and certainly dietitians and nutritionists come in as well. Okay, so it's not just you have, you go, you have the procedure and all your prayers are answered. It's Absolutely not. Day. Lots of hard work afterwards. I was watching something very disturbing the other day, Doc, about social media, on social media, and they talk about would the invention of things like Snapchat and uh, you know the memes and stuff that are out there that people actually want to come to come to the likes of you and have a procedure done that's going to make them look like that polished or that that character that that they actually find themselves posting you know on, on, on social mm -hmm. media with the whatever lips and the big eyes are you seeing yes. a lot of that is that a worry at the moment the, the selfie generation has yeah. definitely uh, come upon us and every medical practitioner will tell you that this is something, it's a phenomenon we've seen a uh, huge growth of in the last, I would say, about three to four years. Uh, it's getting worse. And we're having to convince especially younger people, uh, you know, to be rational, to be reasonable, and, uh, you know, not to believe everything they see online uh, because, unfortunately, it has created misperce misperceptions uh, among people that, uh, you know, people have these supermodel features and, uh, you know, wonderful, uh, beautiful toned skins and and, uh, and, and, and great shaped eyes and noses and, and, and great proportions, uh, sometimes even uh, weird proportions. And, and, you know, you have to bring them back down to earth. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm praying for the day that we return to the trend where people are proud of what they look like. Yeah. Uh, Everyone's beautiful in many ways, and I, and I hope that people will start to enjoy and embrace that about themselves. Fantastic. I think that's a good note to end on, Doc, and I'm sure you have some life-saving surgery to get to, so we'll Thank let you go. Thank you so much for your time, very much. Dr. Ridman Rina there. Coming up, we continue with our health focus. We are talking about aesthetics today. We're talking about surgical and non-surgical procedures, uh, and we'll also be looking at the psychology behind procedures, the transformation, and how one actually copes with that. All of that's on the way.